Hello, welcome to the sixth lecture of ECE 141. In this lecture, we'll be talking about the digital channel model. It's still the same channel that we're transmitting to, but now we're going to be talking about talking about it in terms of its behavior when we're transmitting digital signals or digital symbols. Just to review, uh, all communication must pass through a channel. It's an environment to uh, pass through when we're going to deliver our message from source to destination. Right? But this channel is unforgiving and harsh, therefore corrupts. It corrupts the signal SM of T, which, are, which is our symbol, and it becomes a received si signal RM of T. To visualize that, uh, there's, we'll use again a simple human communication system where we generate a message okay, from our source, modulate that, okay, convert it to a stubble form, but it will be destroyed by noise. But we want the receiver to be able to recognize that. Right? The simplest channel is the additive noise channel. An external random process, R of T, N of T rather, corrupts our transmitted signal and it becomes R of T. So basically we just add these two signals. Right? And uh, the possible sources of that would be random movement of electrons or thermal noise, some other transmitters, that are transmitting okay, and adds to the signal, noise added by transistors, and all that. The relationship is just, you just need to add them. Just to review then, our random variable okay, comes from our uh, sample space omega, and P sub R is that probability of the random variable occurring. So the random variable actually maps some point from that sample space to a probability. So it's not seen here. It should be P sub R. The probability distribution can be defined by your cumulative distribution, distribution function fx of x. Okay. So basically, it's just a mapping from your sample space to your probability. A Gaussian random variable can be completely described by its mean and variance. It has your probability distribution function, which is the derivative of your cumulative distribution, and you get this expression right here. Sigma is the variance. Sigma squared, rather, is the variance. Mu is the mean. So if we have a lot of random variables that are Gaussian, we define them as jointly Gaussian, okay? So that is this vector right here. That is, all of these are actually jointly, I'm oh, sorry, not jointly. All of these are actually Gaussian random variables, okay? And they, are, they form a vector with dimension n, okay? And they are IID or independent, and identically distributed. Okay? So that's just what it means when we say jointly Gaussian random variable. It can convert it to a vector. Okay? So uh, the mean of this jointly Gaussian random vector can be defined by the means of each random variable. The variance is defined by this matrix. We call this the covariance matrix. Okay. And its diagonals are the variance of each individual random variable. So the probability distribution function of this jointly Gaussian random vector is just, again, still defined by the mean and its, in this case now, covariance matrix. And you get this equation for that. So uh, if we combine or add all these Gaussian random variables, just add or subtract them, you still get a Gaussian random variable. Random processes are time index collection of random variables. 
if we take a snapshot of a random process in time, let's say V1, it has a certain distribution. Okay? So this V1 at this time has a certain distribution. Let's say if it's Gaussian, then it's distributed by a Gaussian function, defined by a Gaussian function rather. Since we don't know the actual form of the wave, we cannot compute its Fourier transform. And they are generally unpredictable. But we can analyze them using their statistical properties. So uh, just to define, we have your ensemble average. Basically, the average of the variables at a snapshot, snapshot in time. The time average is just getting the average of the values that we get when we're measuring it over time. Okay. The process is ergodic if these two are equal. So to uh, characterize random variables, we use uh, the first moment, the second moment, and some higher moments. But uh, for this course, we'll just use the first and the second moment. The first moment is just the mean. This is the time average of your random variable. So it's basically this equation right here. The second moment is the covariance. Okay, the covariance between two random variables, okay, which is defined by this, and can now be defined by the autocorrelation function. Right, if we just remove these means, so this is called the second central moment. And this is called the second moment. Right? And uh, this is called or can be defined as the measure of relatedness between two random processes. A special case, if T1 and T2 are equal, then the autocorrelation function becomes the mean square value of your random variable. With these uh, definitions or parameters, we can define if a random process is stationary. Stationarity arises from statistical invariance to a shift of the time origin. That just means that at any point in time, your random process, the properties of your random process, its mean, variance, and all that is still the same, okay? regardless of the time. But uh, that is your, this formal definition right here, that is the definition of your strictly stationary uh, random process. We have the white sense stationary to uh, easily loosen or lax the requirements for our analysis. The white sense stationary process has a constant mean over time and its autocorrelation function is not it's not a uh, function of time, rather, it's a function of its time difference. Okay? If a process is ergodic, that means it's white sense stationary. But it's not the other way around. So, an important property is if we get the Fourier transform of our autocorrelation function, we get our power spectral density. Now, if we filter this wide stand stationary random process, some of its elements are preserved, okay? And some will be modified. So what are the uh, parameters that we want to look at? We want to look at the first and second moments, your stationarity, what would happen, and it's what we call Gaussianity. Okay. Your stationarity is preserved under LTI filtering. Gaussianity is also preserved. Okay. The PSD of your random process will be also filtered out by the LTI filter. Okay. And basically, if you just summarize this using an equation, your... Uh, wait. So your S... Uh, filtered, let's say SF, SF 
of f is basically just equal to the magnitude response of your filter h of f squared multiplied by the power spectral density of your random process. Once it is filtered, you get a new uh, power spectral density defined by your filter. Okay, so what happens to the first moment? The first moment of the output basically is just scaled by your filter. The second moment is convolved depending on the filter response. And because of that, your output becomes this. Okay. Your random process, uh, the Gaussianity is preserved if you use an LTI filter. So even if you separate the signal using different filters, G1 of T to GM of T, you get a set of values that are jointly Gaussian. Okay? Since we preserve the Gaussianity of the random process after filtering, if we have a set of values after filtering it using different filters, the set of values create a vector. Now, if these filters form an ortho orthonormal basis, phi1 to phi m, your noise or your random process can actually be represented as vectors. And each element of this vector, let's focus here, each element of this vector is Gaussian. Okay. So this is a Gaussian random variable. That means your noise vector, okay, which is this one, the noise vector is actually an independent, identically distributed random variable, each of its element. With this, we can now simplify the relationship between the received signal, the transmitted signal, and the noise in vector form. Okay? And this is where the noise comes from. Mainly from this one. Okay, so the random movement of the electrons arise uh, is where noise arises. And uh, we can model that as this. You just add some random process to your transmitted signal. So to characterize the noise, we can use its power. And the power is equal to getting the autocorrelation of noise at a zero delay, which is equal to this. And this is actually just your inner product. And if we get the expected value of that inner product or the expected value of the norm of n squared, we get the noise power. Your AWGN channel, the uh, probability of n, the probability distribution of n is this. In vector form, it becomes this equation right here. And this will be important when we're going to be discussing the modulating your symbols. Okay? So if it's white noise, that means at any time delay, your autocorrelation becomes zero. And that now becomes your vector channel model. So if you have a channel, you uh, get some received signal R from some transmitted sig signal M, this vector channel model actually uh, this vector channel model actually outputs a signal R depending on your transmitted signal SM. Therefore, it's characterized by its probability, uh, conditional probability function. Okay? So, that would mean that uh, your, we can infer this 
transmitted symbol SM given an R. Just some note that P of R is just equal to this equation right here, which is a property of your conditional probabilities. Okay. So it follows that your received signal under an AWGN channel, so we add a noise to this transmitted symbol. And it seems like your transmitted symbol is displaced due to noise. To visualize that, if we transmitted this symbol SM, it will be displaced by some value N right here. And this is our received signal. Further visualization looks like this. If we have 8 dB SNR, we're transmitting QPSK or 4 PSK. Okay. If we have a larger SNR, then we get this uh, isolation right here. Okay. So you can still see your symbols, but uh, if since there is noise, a lot of these received symbols are displaced from its original value. Same is true with this one. So it's displaced. Right now, depending on the noise power, how much displacement is this? How do you demodulate these signals then? So that would be a question for the next lecture. So this is the end of this lecture. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to leave a comment below. Okay. Uh, thank you for listening. I'll see you next meeting.